Good evening, folks. I hope you're all well. I'm sorry about that. You could clearly hear that I was, I was just testing everyone to make sure that you were all listening correctly. But yeah, um, this is the wonders of live. This is why we do it live. Um, thanks ever so much for joining me, guys. My name is Tommy Reynolds. I'm a portrait and travel photographer. And this is episode two of Lockdown 2.0. Um, before we go any further, just uh, obviously you can hear me. I can see that now. But I remember last time I did this, there were some issues with the gain of the microphone. I don't, I, I can't hear what you guys are hearing, unfortunately. So let me know if it sounds a little bit better. I'm just going to park myself away and just uh, tweak here until you're happy with it. But if you've heard the music at the start, it was uh, that's a very nostalgic piece of music. That was what we used at um, for quite a lot of the behind the scenes videos way back in the day when we first started doing this. And that's what we're talking about tonight. Tonight's going to be all about video, talking about behind the scenes, what gear you should use and what equipment we we did use in our behind the scenes videos. And if you've got any questions about video, then do drop them in. But tonight's really special because I've got a guest. I actually have a guest on uh, this one and it's none other than Mr. Michael Mowbray. So if you don't know Mike, he is responsible for all of my behind the scenes videos, pretty much. 99% of my YouTube channel is his portfolio. Um, but we're going to be chatting with him, hearing from the horse's mouth about his experience um, doing the behind the scenes video. So let's see if this works. Let's see if we can bring Mike on and let's see if his audio and visuals are working as well. Or we're going to have um, something turn up like I just did. Right, let's bring him on. Hey, Mike, how you doing? <laughs> Hello, mate. I'm all good. How are you? Not too bad. Not too bad. Uh, I can uh, c can you hear me okay? Can you see me okay? Yeah. yeah, all good, all good. Awesome, man. Awesome. Right, we'll just uh, have a look at the comments real quick. Sounds good to me. Mike is still... Uh, sounds fine. All good here. Okay, great. Awesome. The only thing I can't work out, everyone's talking about you having a drink. I feel like I've missed out on this memo. What, what's this about? Okay, so this is... Um, the first time I did this, I, was ha I had a glass of Baileys, and uh, it, it was only one. It was only one. I wasn't that tipsy but i was i just felt like a, a little bit merry but i've got water tonight okay okay perfect perfect <laughs> cool 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 <laughs> yeah i've done the same i've gone for a for a water as well you've got a water as well okay yeah, yeah, yeah. um <laughs> so we've got who we've we got listening we've got uh rick hey Hi, tommy uh mark wilshire hello made it here for the first time good to have you here guys uh stephen jenkinson is here Steven's here. Oh, we've got loads of we've got loads of people here. Great, 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 great. <laughs> <laughs> straight vodka. No. <laughs> Not yeah, straight to, vodka. To be fair, one Bailey's and you're drunk, Tom. What's going on? <laughs> <laughs> Proper lightweight. Um at at the end of every single uh behind the scenes shoe, we always go for a Nando's. That's always a tradition. Always a Nando's as like a little victory thing for for finishing it but okay so let's jump straight in so guys if you have any questions about video at all with regards to gear or anything specific like a specific behind the scenes video you want to um hear about we are going to be talking about some of our favorite behind the scenes videos um, what's my what are you laughing at me too? I'm, I'm just laughing a friend of mine's just commented i heart mike mowbray's work <laughs> <laughs> oh dear <laughs> uh, so um so mike let's 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 kick things off so um yeah let's um tell me about how you kind of got into the industry like go take us back to the beginning briefly and how you kind of uh progress from working to becoming a, f a full-time professional cinematographer okay so um i initially started out um in photography like most people um and i got myself my first camera whilst i was at school studying my gcse's and then on to my a levels and then it was, you know, I had a 550D at the time, and obviously that had the uh, the video feature. So just naturally it progressed from that, like flicking it to video and sort of having a play and, and an experiment. Um, and then one of my uh, projects at school was uh, like, you, you could basically do a project on anything that you wanted regarding photography or video. So I thought, oh, let, let's try looking at like how to set up a business and sort of took it from there really. Um, and then just started pick, like networking, meeting other people like yourself, for example. Um, and it kind of like, kind of snowballed, really. Um, I initially thought that I was going to go to university to study um, 
photography and filmmaking but the works the work side of things picked up and i started to get a bit more experience so i thought i'll try giving that side a go first like just solely working um and if it, that doesn't work then i then i'd look at like a university option but yeah things started picking up from there really um yeah and <laughs> that cool cool um so when so what take take us back to the the the, the very first job that you ever ever did with me can you rem- can you remember that can you remember the first time that um yeah i, I approached you to uh, to work with me yeah so I, I remember you had put out a post on facebook asking for videographers um you were filming somebody's music video and you needed like a four camera setup mm-hmm. um because you only obviously had the one because it was a live take video um so you only had one one chance to get it and um through my i was gonna say well girlfriend but my wife now my girlfriend at the time she um through one of her friends knew you and sort of you know we, we started talking um and then yeah it kind of went from there really and we sort of we met up on the video shoot i remember i was really nervous turning up with my 550d shooting everything automatic there was no <laughs> no manual setting in sight everything was also it was uh and i remember we we shot it all it went really well i was really happy with it and then i sort of spoke to you afterwards and you were like right i've got a few little bits of feedback <laughs> rightfully so rightfully so um and then we sort of i remember we had a bit of a sit down you sort of much like you do with other people now sort of gave me a bit of a a talking about you know try taking it out of auto uh, automatic mode go into manual and then sort of yeah it sort of all kicked off from there really didn't it but i was just trying to think um before uh, like an hour ago i was trying to think exactly when that was was that in 2013 i think it was about about eight no, years, eight I think years it ago? Was, I think it was longer than that, if I'm honest. Was it? Yeah, I think it might have been. a. I mean, maybe I'm wrong, but I feel like it was It was before that. Because um, around that sort of time, like 2012, 2013, I think I was. Um, I started working on my short films around that sort of time. Oh, so and it was I know even that, earlier then. Yeah, but, yeah, before that. I think it might have been like 2011. So it's so it's been about nine years then since yeah since I've known nine you. years you haven't been able to shift me <laughs> haven't been able to shift yeah <laughs> that's cool no that's really cool man um yeah I could what well, the the whole thing where when I first when I first met you because I remember that remember it really well I remember you you were so prof- you were so professional you were so prim and proper walking into the room with your five fifty D in your hand yeah and um um and yeah you were shooting in auto and I. I but but regardless of the fact you were shooting in auto, what really drew me to you was just that you were, we got on so well and your, yeah. your enthusiasm. I, I really enjoyed your passion and your enthusiasm because, you know, in our industry, and I'm sure you know, working in you know, bigger sets or bigger TV shows is that you can, uh, people can be on pedestals, but. Oh yeah, definitely. definitely. But obviously what I liked about, about you was just that you were really, really hungry to, to learn and um, we just got on really well. So oh, it, was, yeah, it was natural to, uh, to bring you on on more shoots and then we just progress from there so yeah yeah, cool. yeah and i remember it like i sort of so as well as working for yourself i was doing like other bits like some things shooting for myself some things assisting other people just sort of like networking and getting as much experience as possible and then i remember like with you it was lo- there was loads of music video shoots because that was a big thing for you at the time you were doing a lot of music videos weren't you yeah so we uh, th- so at the time when i first met you we we weren't we didn't shoot a behind the scenes video for for a couple of years i was doing a lot of um, music video work i had my own video work and was bringing you on as a, an assistant or helping me film with those and it wasn't yeah. until i think we did our first behind the scenes video which everyone thinks is the ballet video the first ballet oh, video oh really that's interesting god which there was every- loads before that <laughs> But the but uh, the the real true first one. Do you remember it? Oh, sorry. I'm I now I'm now on board. You mean the the ballet video we done? Um, yeah. I've, oh I'm yeah, yeah, sorry. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah. Very... Uh, yeah. I do remember the first one. It was um in uh, Moat Park, wasn't it? It was. Yeah. yeah. Do you know? I might even be able to play a little clip because I want to just show. Oh God, please don't. <laughs> I will, I'll show I'll show a very brief little clip. I'll keep the sound off. I've, it's yeah. not it's not on my YouTube anymore. I've unlisted it. <laughs> Cheers, mate. <laughs> very, very good but I want to just show everyone at home. I'm sorry to do this to you, Mike, but I want to no, show no, the progression honestly, it's fine, of it's Michael fine. Mowbray. So, what were you filming um, this video on? Do you remember? I think this would have been one of the 5D Mark Twos that we had. 
5D Mark II. Okay, so let yeah. me see if I can crossfade and see if this is oh, going to work. Hang on. <laughs> so wow. So this this everyone here is Mike's. Look at that steady cam work. Look <laughs> Oh, was that was that steady cam? That that must have been handheld. <laughs> <laughs> rough, rough and ready. Rough and ready. They, look, mate, you haven't even gotten a, a proper assistant there. That was the um, that was the model sister, wasn't it? That was the mod. <laughs> that was the model sister. Yeah, just help helping us out. But yeah, but look, I, but I don't I think, think I we... gave you a. Br I didn't think I gave you a brief. I just well, said... we kind of did. I mean, I I roughly remember we sort of um. You know, we wanted this to be really sort of uh, like off the cuff, like this, like much of you sort of talking um, as you're about to do something. We had like really upbeat music. It was very sort of like a copyright free YouTube video, if that makes any sense. Yeah, I remember the music I chose. Like... Yeah, yeah, it was all sort of like that, wasn't it? Very different to the style that we've now adopted now, right? <laughs> definitely, definitely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I mean, actually, you know, it's funny you're bringing this up. It's, it, you know, there's still some like elements that you like you've been I'm an idiot turn on that set. off now. <laughs> <laughs> wow. That was, uh, yeah, that was something, wasn't it? <laughs> but, um, but uh, moving on to uh, to uh, um, a question, actually. So uh, we had a few questions that came in on uh, my Facebook group. If you're if you're yeah. not a part of it and you want to want to join, it's Tommy Reynolds's Geek Group. So if you want to come and um, come and join that group, usually I I will share content before it goes live to YouTube on there, and I w will often do polls or get feedback and opinions on on my my work with that kind of community. So if you want to join that. Please do. But we did get quite a few questions actually come in through that geek group that I want to um, pass them through to you now. And uh, on that topic, someone, uh, uh, Stephen Jenkinson, Stephen Jenkinson actually provided us with quite a, um, quite a few questions, which I was planning to ask, going to ask you anyway, Mike. But yeah, did Michael start with the DSLR to video your behind the scenes? So you kind of answered that, but yeah. you, you kind of had a couple of DSLRs before you progressed to the camera you have now. So did you want to... Talk yeah, definitely. Yeah. So, um, so like I said earlier, my first um, camera that was sort of like my workhorse whilst I was sort of learning and getting my, my main bulk of experience was a, a Canon 550D or like, I think it's called a T2i as well. I think yep. that might be what it's called. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I had that for, for a long while. Um, but then I think when, when me and you started getting a bit more professional and, you know, we, we sort of spoke about things, I remember purchasing a 5D Mark III. Mm -hmm. um, and that again was my sort of workhorse for for a long time, um, and then I had a real big decision to make because I wanted to get myself a new camera, but just like I had to make that choice between do I stay DSLR, do I go mirrorless, um, you know, or do I want to go for something a bit more sort of broadcast quality, which is what I decided to do in the end. And I've now um, got myself a, a Sony FS5, um, and yeah, I mean, obviously I, I never look back, but uh i mean it yes yeah <laughs> How, it's a bit of, um, of a change so when did you get the fs5 uh, i think that was about two years ago now two years ago so right up until then it was 5d mark threes yep for, so, for pretty much from uh, from that first um like i said that that shoot that you just shot sorry that behind the scenes you just showed there that was um a 5d mark ii but i think that that first ballet video that we did afterwards was with a 5d mark three and that went all the way up until um, I think it might have been the next ballet shoot. Can you yeah. think of one beforehand? No, I, the first the first video you shot with your new camera, the FS5, was the when we were testing out gravity backgrounds. Um, when, oh when we used, yes, uh, Beltcraft Studios in London, um, because uh, and and I even I noticed it. So for those of you that that don't realise, my um, Mike shoots all the, all of my work, but I actually edit all of his his footage, and I could tell straight away editing clips from a 5d mark III versus grading with the fs5 it was just so so different it's so much sharper um it's just it's a pleasure to grade with and on, on that topic um what have been the be the benefits to uh, with that upgrade what what why why has the fs5 been a been a better purchase and and how does it compare to the 5d mark III? what 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 was the 5d mark III lacking that you wanted when you upgraded your camera so that's a really good question. Um, I think the main thing for me was that with the 5D Mark III, obviously it is initially built as a stills camera, which mm. is perfect, you know, and the fact that they've given you so many video features in it um, is phenomenal. But 
I do more video work than I do photography. So mm -hmm. there's so many features that I'm always wanting to try and get my hands on. And I had to use things like I'm apologizing, but I did put Magic Lantern on my camera. Um, <laughs> so, uh, and for people that don't know, that's like uh, basically like a, a hack that someone's, um, or it's like a piece of software almost that, that changes the firmware on the camera, isn't it? Um, and that gives you extra features like focus peaking and crop marks and um, and other bits that you ju that just make life a little bit more easier when you're filming. Um, but the reason I decided to go for more of a broadcast camera this time, um, as I said, I do mainly video work and also I do a lot of um, TV work as well. So I needed something that had a few more broadcast features like built in XLR ports, um, like manual changing of the, um, the sound on the side. Uh, I needed something that could be shoulder rigged a lot, a lot easier because I felt like it, when I was doing that with my 5D Mark III, it was kind of becoming a bit of like a like a Connect Lego set. You know, you you putting all these different mm. parts on to try and put it on your shoulder, whereas now I've just got one built built rig that goes from my shoulder onto a tripod. Um, but obviously, at the end of the day, a camera is a camera, and as long as you you know if you can get it to do what you need it to do, it doesn't matter what camera you've got. So. On, on that subject, you mentioned some of the accessories then that you use. You mentioned that you've got um, a shoulder rig. So yeah, um, what would you take on one of my behind the scenes shoots? What what mm. what are, what's a, what are accessories that will always come with you to regardless of the shoot? What would always come okay. with you? Great question. So um, the most important thing I could bring with me is the tripod. Mm -hmm. So if all else fails, if I can't get the camera off on a shoulder rig, if I can't do a nice slider move or a steady cam, anything like that, a tripod. It's like it is just the. I, I know it's a very basic thing to say, but that really is sort of like the bread and butter to filmmaking mm. for me. Um, and which so, sorry, and which tripod is it that you that you specifically own? So I used to use a. Uh, I've got it. I'm actually using it right now. A Velborn DV700. Um, and that's just sort of like, that's just, a, it's like an okay tripod. It's not perfect, but it will, it's okay. It will do the job. Um, but now I've got a, um, a Miller Solo. Uh, I can't remember the exact name off the top of my head. Um, Miller, that's the name of the company, isn't it? Yeah, a Miller tripod. And I, I believe it's called a Solo. Um, but yeah, that's, I, I, I love that tripod. It, it's great. I mean, it's a, it's a little bit costly, but. I think for the amount of work that I do with a tripod, I, I need it. And especially as my camera's a little bit heavier now, I just needed something that I, you know, wouldn't blow over. And I could also go super high and super low with. And so on that topic, um, where do you, um, so do, where, how do you source your video work? So, uh, or do you, uh, with the work that you do, you don't need to bring your equipment, you just kind of turn up. So, so that all depends. So I do a, a varied amount of work. So the main, the main work that I've been getting, I mean, pre coronavirus, <laughs> <laughs> of course, um, it was, it was a lot of, uh, TV and corporate work. Um, and you know, I'm including your work in this as a, as a corporate work, essentially, you know, working for a business, creating promotional videos for them. Mm -hmm. Um, so with the TV stuff, um, I would say nine times out of 10, I wouldn't be bringing my own equipment. I'd be mainly on as a camera assistant. So that's a whole different thing in itself. I'd have a camera, like camera assistance bag, you know, clapperboard, uh, camera tapes, all those sort of necessary things you'd need to, to be a camera assistant on set. Um, uh, the occasional time they'd ask me if I could bring like a specific lens or a tripod, which would be hired out. Um, but other than that, no, I don't, I don't usually need equipment for that but it's mainly for if i do like my own documentaries or, um or a lot of corporate work which require a, a broadcast quality camera gotcha um i think i jumped to this question before we actually finished answering That's the okay. previous That's question okay. so um you mentioned sorry the uh, the tripod that you bring so yeah. what else do you always bring on a behind the scenes video shoot uh, a shoulder rig that's my next go-to thing um i because as you know, as, you, as you've seen, you've seen if you've watched any of our work, there's a lot of movement. And especially as we're in a studio environment, although a lot of the elements are controlled, we're still very much sort of run and gun and on, on the go. So I, I'd like to, I like having that availability there with the shoulder rig, especially as we've got to get a lot of, you know, we go from close up shots to wides. Um, there might just be like, I have to point up and get a close up logo shot of a, of a light or something. Mm -hmm. And, and if I had the chance to, yes, I'd shoot all of that on a tripod or a slider, but 
it's always time permitting. You know, you have to, you have to choose your battles, and it, if it comes down to it, I want to make sure I've got a nice sturdy shoulder rig to to get those those shots covered. Really, cool. So. To recap, so it was the the middle tripod, yep. your shoulder rig. You mentioned uh, a slider, so that comes with you as well, right? Yep. The slider I've got at the moment isn't perfect. Um, it's 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 good, but you know, it's it's one of those things. I've got a, like it goes on top of my middle tripod, and then I've got two um, lighting stands either side, which I spread the legs on just to to stop the wobble. But I just wish there was a. It was fine when I when I use a DSLR on that. Um, slider it's perfect but my camera's a little bit too heavy that it just i need the lighting stands then it becomes really cumbersome so if anyone out there's got a good recommendation on a new slider that that um can fit on a single tripod please let me know because you know we we've used it on previous shoots before but the rhino slider is is my next go-to but again that cannot just be operated on one tripod it's still just it's still a bit cumbersome no definitely but so that that's everything that you take with you and well um so pr previously before i had uh the sony fs5 when i used to use the 5d mark iii we'd use the um i'd use a glide cam as well um but now that we i've moved up in the camera it just it's not time permitting enough on the shoot so if if we decide that uh a behind the scenes will warrant some stabilization like some some steady cam shots or glide cam shots um then we we use well it all depends on the shoot but usually we use cassie's gh5 and um she's got a is it a it's not a dji ronin is it it's a zion crane it's a zion um zion weeble studio gimbal it oh, was designed a bit of a mouthful <laughs> i can't remember the exact name Z zion weeble i think it was uh, it's not yeah. the, it's not for the it's not the heaviest one because it's uh more designed for mirrorless cameras but yeah we yeah. we kind of go for that one don't we when when we need yeah. but we've not really used them um, glide cam shots in a while really because no. of well bec because of that limitation not limitation but um you you're right it is very time consuming like getting all of these lovely cinematic shots is time consuming and uh so we we i, th I think we're very good at managing our time effectively so um uh, one a question that we did get through that i haven't put it up here so i'll just say but um is you know how long do our shoots typically last and i think that over the years they've increased more and more in time and that's Definitely. only because really we're because we've got this level of production quality that we really enjoy making it's it's meant that we want to you know obviously keep that on par and make that better but to make it better we need more time in order to get these really nice cinematic shots so they Definitely. i think they they started at about three or four hour shoots and now they're at least six hours our shoots yeah. they're at least six hours and uh it takes about an hour to bring all the bloody equipment in when we start a shoot doesn't it? <laughs> it does it does you know the it unload really, time the unload time well because yeah because we have so much gear it really does it really is a factor when i'm looking for a studio is uh, you know is ground like it does it have ground floor access and yeah. can we park like these are the other questions like i've not even gone into the studio yet but I'm, yeah, i want to know yeah. you know um and if we're streaming now that's a new question that i like to ask is what's your upload speed because if we're going to do a live stream there i want to know the uh the upload yeah, speed. yeah, but, yeah. you know but i digress a little bit can um, i say one last thing on that because yeah, i've just seen um dan's made a great <laughs> a great comment um that cassie reynolds is also one of the other things that i must bring to a to a tommy reynolds behind the scenes <laughs> shoot <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was a great, great question. Uh, just comment, sorry. Yeah, I mean, Cassie, having an assistant has changed the way we've worked so much because, as we were sort of saying earlier, um, previously, I've, I've always just sort of done it as a one-man band. So it's, mm -hmm. it can be quite difficult, you know, going from shoulder rig back to tripod, back to slider. And, you know, each time we do a different setup, um, it's kind of nice to try and get a variation of shots on each setup. Otherwise, you know, it will be all tripod or all this or all that. So I've had to a lot of, a lot of times previously before having an assistant, I've had to sacrifice shots because mm. I know it'd be too time consuming, but now having Cassie on board is fantastic. Like she'll, she'll be setting something up for me. I'll say to her, you know, can you get the, the slider out and ready for me positioned over there? And then we can be getting this shot finished, set up, you know, 
taking our time with it. And then already I know that sort of that five, 10 minute setup time I'd need for the slider is already done and it's already there and ready. So big shout out to Cassie. Thank you. <laughs> uh, Cassie, the unsung hero. <laughs> she is the unsung hero. I did ask if she wanted to join us tonight, but she said she was too nervous and didn't want to, didn't want to come on. But, um, but, but yeah, but um, so speak, speaking of that, so yeah, it used to all just be yourself, one man band. And just yep. again, you know, we said about how we need more time to create these cinematic shots. <laughs> oh, and she's watching. And she's watching. My pleasure, Mush. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Cassie. Cheers, Cassie. Um, yeah, so, um, so not only do I have an assistant, but I will... I will make sure that you have an assistant. If it's if it's not Cassie, if she's not available, I will try and make sure that you have an assistant. And I, you know, speaking just to the audience, you know, that's really important to me that Mike has all the help that he can get. Because the more help that Mike gets, the more uh, the better the quality that he's going to create. The the better video that I'm going to have, you know, overall. So um, we actually did a shoot between first lockdown and this lockdown and I'm in the middle of editing it at the moment, um, a new person project that we, we worked on and we could only have six people on set and I sacrificed having an assistant. I had no assistant for that shoot. I, but instead I let, I, Cassie came along, but she didn't assist me. She assisted Mike. I wanted Mike to have all the assistance because moving from this, the, uh, the piece of equipment that we like to use, as he said, just takes time. So having, Cassie is now it's now become a new necessity so we, we can talk about you know like things that we always do on um on our shoots and even beforehand in a sec but and but that is one of them that is one yeah. of them we always like to have an assistant not just for m myself but also especially for Mike as well definitely but but I mean it, I think it sort of you know it goes to say with you know we we do have all of these things that we that we like require on a shoot you know but that's only because we have set ourselves a goal of of how we like them to look. I mean, mm. of course, you know, you can just go out with a photographer and and one videographer, or you know, you can just be a photographer and set a, a GoPro up, or if you've mm. got a second camera, set that up, or an iPhone. You know, you, you've got the cameras on iPhone now, phenomenal. You you know, you can don't don't be put off or worried by some of the things we've said. You know, yeah. you know, you don't have to have a tripod, shoulder rig, slider, an assistant, this that. They make your life easier, and yeah. yes, there's a good chance you probably will get a much better result. But they're not essential. You can, you know, you can do it by yourself. Going away from from gear briefly, we'll come back. But as we're on this topic, I think it's important to know. And you've obviously made a really good point there, Mike, about you know equipment. You know, having the equipment that we use is not essential to tell a good story, to tell a good behind the scenes. Yeah. So why do you think behind the scenes video in general why do you think that they just do so well and what we as creators or photographers or even videographers what is it about behind the scenes that's so attractive to to people i mean it's that's quite a subjective question but i know that definitely for me i i love seeing the process of how something's made um you know like f for example you know so like looking at one of your images you look at it and you think oh that's you know incredible you know however you feel about it and you think to yourself i'd like to know exactly what went into making that how because i think it can be quite inspiring because you can look at that see how it's done behind the scenes and you think oh yeah you know you know i could actually achieve that that's not as that's not as difficult as the final product mm. to make things look um and you know i find the same for that when i watch films i'll watch like a, a christopher nolan film and be like blown away by a sequence that they that they've um managed to create and you think oh my god how how have they done that and then it's that sort of like that human need for information, isn't it? Yeah. Like yeah. you have to know. You just have to know. And then sometimes you feel pretty good when you watch something. You see how they've done it. And you go, oh, yeah, I can do that. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's easy. That's easy. They just, they just beat me to it. They beat me to it. Uh, Mark Wilshire, how long uh, would you say it takes uh, you and Mike to really get to know each other in a workflow capacity? Um, and and, and how in sync with each other are you now? Yeah, do you want to do you want to see if you can answer that one for us, Mike? Yeah, I mean, so as as Tommy sort of mentioned earlier, you know, we we met through work initially, um, and I don't think it took long for me and you to sort of like build that friendship. Um, and uh, you know, as you said, we've known each other for nine years now, so we're talking with nine years of experience. But mm. yeah, I mean, I, it definitely didn't take us long to 
to sort of get into that in sync. But in terms of like with the videos, as again, you you saw the original video that we done. It wasn't perfect. You know, there was a lot of things that we knew we needed to improve on. And, and as you mentioned earlier, you know, you don't think that you gave me a full brief. Whereas now, it's not like as though you're sort of telling me exactly what to do. But we sort of will have meetings beforehand or we have like a phone call like oh, i've got this idea of something i want to do you know i'd love to get behind the scenes for it here's the locations i've been looking at and then we're sort of we start bouncing things off each other immediately to, you know like we'll be on the phone or like we'll facetime and, and ha have the image of the location up and be like oh that'd be a great shot for this or that'd be a great shot for that and i think just sort of like naturally you start bouncing things off of each other don't you and sort of like build up a rapport really no yeah definitely definitely but um on that subject again in when it comes to the planning process of of our shoots i think that what we tend to do now is again because we've built up this um production that we, and, and we want to get the most out of the uh, out of the space with the time that we have as well so now if we can we like to record the location as well oh, definitely. and and this is really important as well um so if you're working with a a videographer especially if you're working with a a new videographer um if you can record the location then you should. So in the beginning, I maybe would record the location on my own and kind of feedback maybe to Mike. But when um, I think it was the the newer ballet shoot that we did two years ago, we we recorded it. And I remember we said to the guy, we'll, we'll, we'll be about 15 minutes. And I think we were there for an hour and a half. <laughs> we were there for yeah. an hour and a half wrecking, but it was so worthwhile, wasn't it? Oh, uh, we, that and, and I think you know, we've said countless times that we think that might be one of our favorite videos. And I think, I think that's why, because that was that first time that we really sort of gave, gave a chance to sort of develop the video. And we sort of, like you said, we were there for an hour and a half. We were like running up the ladders, taking shots up there. This would be a great idea for a shot. Let's go down here. Oh, the, the light will come through this window, at this sort of time of day and stuff. And, and it just boosted everything. It was just, oh, it, made, it made life so much easier as well, because as you mentioned earlier, when you know you used to previously recce the location by yourself, if we didn't have a, a chance to speak beforehand before the shoot, we would spend sort of 15, 20 minutes at the beginning of the shoot going through that. And that slows yep. everything down. That eats into your time. Yeah, yeah. You know, there's nothing better than going to a shoot knowing, right, once the equipment's set up, we're, we're starting off with this, then we're going to this and we're shooting here. And, you, you know, you feel a bit more relaxed and comfortable about the day. And it's sort of like, it's like anything, isn't it? You know, if you, if you prepare beforehand, you're always you're always feeling sort of like one step ahead of yourself, really. No, yeah, definitely. I remember Alfred Hitchcock said that as well. Um, that uh, famous classic director, he he prided himself on planning, 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 and he he the way he described it was the production or the filming was the easy part because he's done all the hard bit because he he extensively planned it. He just turns up and does what's written down or what's what's been planned and uh Definitely. so i really admire that and again yeah as we said we we spent an hour and a half in this location walking around we even took some artificial lights with us mm. thinking that the room was going to be too dark and we're going to need to light it somehow and we ended yeah, up taking I forgot some about that yeah and we ended up taking some lights didn't we again for yeah. that recce again you know all all for the purpose of testing and then we, I mean, I think we were adamant that we'd need a lot of lighting inside, weren't we? we you know, we were testing, mm. like you said, testing things out. I remember we had your, was it your little Sony RX100 that you were using for the yeah, pictures yeah, and yeah. video? And we were, we were looking at skin tones and we just, it wasn't, it just wasn't working, was it? And, you know, basically doing that recce beforehand saved us all that problem solving on set. Um, and just gave us a bit more confidence when we came in that we knew we didn't have to set lights up and fiddle around with that for ages. You know, we were we were pretty much ready to go, and and I just think that level of planning really does help. No, definitely, definitely. Um, is there any other reasons why this shoot in particular was your favourite? Was it just because of the location, or was it like a, a culmination of things? Or yeah, and I think um, am I right in thinking that this was the first time you you changed the music? You had like this this specific. <laughs> piece of music wasn't it you know no i don't mean it like that i mean yeah, as in yeah, like yeah. you know it was this new piece of music it was like again with that you, you know you had, had the song beforehand so we would listen to, to it before we were like we knew that for this one there needed to be a lot of um steady cam movements because it sort of warranted those slightly longer shots and and it was just honestly it was a culmination of so many things that made this shoot fantastic I, and like you know we had people like andy on board taking pictures um 
we had like a separate camera just for the um for the steady cam and yeah. we had you know we had um partners involved in it like different um com- like companies with, with um products and stuff it was just it was great and obviously ayla was amazing as well it was yeah it was just a really really good shoot and again you had cassie assisting you and what was really nice yeah. about this particular location is there is a tiny little box room in the corner yeah and in that room you had everything set up ready to go rather than everything chucked on the floor you had all your gear ready to go so again these tiny little time uh, uh time saving factors you know wrecking the location and having a you know know knowing what setups that i i want and then mike knows what he needs what he needs to do to get to get that shot yeah um it just makes such a world of difference it really really does um oh and yeah before before we uh leave this video so mike also mentioned music so i already knew what music i was going to use before we even did this and i played that to mike and then that allows mike to kind of get an idea of the pace and how he, you know, how he's how he's going to move the camera because he knows in his head, he's got a rough idea of the pace because he's heard the track before. So again, if I can try and even get as far as having the music ready to go, because we don't, you know, we don't have the luxury of making a piece of film and then having someone else create, you know, the music for us. We don't have that luxury, so we have to kind of reverse engineer that and go backwards. But luckily, we have, you know, fantastic things like Music Bed or epidemic sounds where yep. you can get the music i i personally use music bed um i don't know about if you uh, what how you feel about it but i feel like yeah I, I personally just think that it's even more there's more higher level production quality and i really enjoy using music bed over over anything else so yeah so definitely i'll, yeah. I'll dial that in i'll have that figured out first i'll come to you with the idea and say this is the location this is the music i want to use this is the concept Let's yeah. go and record the location. Then it allows me to talk again about the concept. And now you're in the space. You get an idea of, you know, how it's going to be on the day, where we're going to put stuff, you know. And we ask, you know, stuff like where's plugs, you know, um, uh, what's the light going to be like. We ask the owners all these questions. So, yeah, the more planning you can do, the better the shoot will be, the smoother it will go. And it's just all these time saving factors is going to maybe let you squeeze in one last setup at the end that you might not have had time for. Oh yeah. we, we've had that things. so many times, haven't we? We're like, we're coming down to the last sort of like 10, 15 minutes and we're like, Oh, do you know what? We've done what we said we wanted to do. Can we squeeze another one in? And we're like, yeah, go on off the cuff. Let's just, let's throw something together and see what you can get right <laughs> up until literally like the studio owners looking at you. They're like, yeah, come on, mate. You've got one minute left now. Come on, hurry up. <laughs> Yeah, but we, we always allow ourselves like 45 oh, minutes yeah, to course, uh, to course. pack down, but uh, sorry, to pack up. But it's always the last 20 or 15 minutes that oh, we... Uh, down we to could, the wire. We're, we're like, no, nah, it's all right. We, we can pack We can pack up quicker. We can pack up quicker. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we always do that, don't we? We'll say like, right, there's an hour at the end for packing away. And then there's, there's only about half an hour left because we've decided to add another thing or like, <laughs> or something hasn't, you know, there, there have been times where there have been like, things haven't gone to plan and we've had to slightly overrun and you know there's all there's always these little things it's this yeah just what just what makes a shoot a shoot really um andy holmes uh question for mike what's the most recent technological advancement in video that you're looking forward to using if you haven't already That's that an is an interesting a, that question is a big, andy. yeah big interesting question um it, this might not be a massive technological advancement, but you sent me through the other day. Um, I'm going to forget the name of it now, but I know it's by, it's by Film Convert. It's a new a new plugin. Can you can you Cin- help out? It's uh, Cinematch. Cinematch. So um, as I mentioned earlier, obviously I've got my Sony FS5. You know, um, sometimes we shoot with Cassie's GH5. We've had um, Sony. Uh, sorry. Uh, Canon 5D Mark IVs on set. We've shot, shot stuff with Panasonic, you know. We and uh, sometimes we have had multiple um, multiple cameras going at the same time, even sometimes for your live shoots. Hmm. Um, and one thing that always is a pain in the ass and takes so much time is is trying to color grade and color match the cameras, you know. And again, we try to do as much of this beforehand. Like we'll make sure we're shooting everything flat. We'll, we'll try our, our best to match white balances beforehand and, and make sure that we're all in sync with like our base ISOs, things like that. But you're never going to get it spot on. It's just, there's the, the color sciences between cameras are so different. Um, 
But this, can you just repeat what it was called again? Cine match? Cine match, yeah. Cine match, yeah. This, Tommy sent this through, um, it was, was it yesterday or the day before? I think it was, and only, you were like, it was only yesterday that I, dis- yeah. I discovered it. And you were like, oh my God, this is a game changer. This is going to make our life so much better. And I, you know, sort of like think, oh, just like any other sort of like advert thing you click on. And, and I remember clicking on it and being like, oh my God, that sounds amazing. Because basically they sort of, it's almost like a one click button that matches, you know, it won't grade, but it will match all of your cameras um, so that you can start a grade on them and they're all sort of going to be pretty similar. And I just know that that is something that we always struggle with a little bit. And like, you know, I, I know that it's no matter how be- how good we can get it on set that you will you will be spending time in the edit afterwards trying to make them match as best as you can. So that was something that really excited me. And I sort of was thinking mm. to myself, this is this is going to be a, a bit of a game changer, like you said. Especially if you're uh, if we're doing our interview situations, which is something that we're we're kind of doing a lot more now, this kind of hybrid yeah. system of a photo shoot and a vi- and a interview as well and we don't have the luxury of having two fs5s so quite often we'll be using as you said either gh5s or 5d mark fours and you know the log in a canon 5d mark four is very different to yeah. your numerous logs that you've got you know when i when i grade um a 5d mark four log and then i move over to your log it's so different so getting them to match is really hard so if you are um in that situation where you're using multiple cameras, then look up this new thing that's that's not been not been out very long. It's called Cinematch, and it's part of Film Convert. And again, Film Convert is a filter that we use on all of our behind the scenes videos. It gives it that real nice filmic look. So if you want to know what we use for grading, it's Film Convert. Um, I hope that kind of answered your question, Andy. I mean, I can't think of anything cooler to say that makes me sound <laughs> like I really know what I'm talking about. But C- Cine Match is, is the one for me. Uh, just a quick shout out to David. Uh, thank you ever so much, David, for sending us in a super chat. Really helps sending um, uh, any small donations, especially during this time. Really, really do help. So thanks ever so much for thank doing you. that. Um, there was a question to follow up on that. Um, uh, Jack Silver's watching. Every shoot you guys do is awesome. Thanks for sharing your process. Thanks ever so much, Jack. We really appreciate it. Uh, Mark Wilshire, I love Music Bed. Uh, Stephen Jenkins and Music Bed, first choice. Oohs and ahs. <laughs> oohs and ahs. Oohs and ahs. It's all about the oohs and ahs. If, 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 you're, if, you're, if you've used Music Bed and you've used their browse feature, that's, they're my go-tos. If you want to find a Tommy Reynolds behind-the-scenes track, then you free you go to the filters and you want to go ambient cinematic um uh, with oohs and ahs and has build has oohs and ahs and has build i i didn't think that that would ever be a filter but i'm so glad it is so if you want to find a track that i would use it would be it will be those filters when someone was making that advanced search, do you think they were like had to really say to someone, "Oh, you like we definitely need a feature where you people can check for oohs and ahs." And they're like, "No one, <laughs> no one on planet Earth is going to ever click that in a in a search." And then there's you like frantically on your computer. Yep. Yeah. That that's my go-to. <laughs> oohs and ahs. Um. Okay, so just looking at the other questions here. Um. Oh, yes, this is a good question. How do you source your locations to shoot videos? So that's a great question, again, from Stephen Jenkinson. Um, I wrote it down, Stephen. Just bear with me while I find it. So so there's a, a couple of websites that you can you can go on. There's sh- uh, Shoot Factory. It can be quite expensive, but Shoot Factory is basically a, a location directory, which you can go, like, um, research by area, so London, and then you can go industrial or rural or, you know, they're all different types of filters they can be quite expensive but there is another one that i use and it's actually how i found the location for my last um shoot which i'm still in the middle of editing and it's photostudiohire.com let me put that up on screen for you guys photostudiohire.com hang on this i think there's a hyphen in there photo hyphen studio Oh, yeah. And I mean, also as well, there's like sometimes people do stuff on Facebook, don't they? Like little Facebook groups for locations, things like that. Um, yeah, yeah. Check with your local councils. I know that like um, Kent Film Council, they've they've got um, like a sm- it's not it's not great, but they've got a small section on their website of locations that you can use. Um, yeah. And I mean, also, if you know, if you're on the lower end of the budget, just I mean, now's a very difficult time with 
coronavirus but you know you can just speak to friends and family and like people have got like some people have got like you know really um nice gardens or they've got like great rooms in their house you might be able to use things like that as well again on the sort of like smaller scale of things well this this website here photo studio hi i believe that you can actually sign up so that when a new studio becomes available in your area you'll get an email notification and that's exactly what happened with the last um video that we shot in so you might not know it because obviously you've you, there's no video yet but it's in, it's on my instagram that i did with hazel wearing the wedding dress so that location i found on this website they emailed me saying this location's just um just come out and i went straight onto my emails and emailed them and, and straight away we got a recce and we went again and we wrecked it and spoke about what we were going to do how we were going to do it etc etc so yeah use shoot factory or photo studio hire or as um Mike says maybe look into your local council or just reach out to Facebook groups. Sometimes there are groups um, for locations as well. But this has been one of the main things that I've used is photostudiohire.com. Okay, let's have a look. Um, Mike, who inspires you in the world of video? Oh, okay, good question. Um, I mean, he's, he's pretty much a go-to for everyone, but really, Philip Bloom is is fantastic and i i think one of the main things with philip bloom is is that i think he's very approachable and you know he uses a, a wide range of gear so one week you might see him talking about like a you know a thirty thousand pound camera that's like you're never you're never gonna own or like you know is is out of reach for the next couple of years or so but then he'll then talk about something that's like a 200 pound piece of equipment so you get a real varied range and I think that's helpful because you know even though there are these like more expensive equipment and there's you know higher gear out there that you can't afford it's still good to know about them know about like other things that are out there and like the limitations that your cameras have and you know you can also think of ways to be creative um with what you've got and how how you can sort of um use your limitations to your advantage and stuff and i think philip bloom's a great guy for that and he gives such in-depth detail about equipment about about things that we're talking about now you know um like on his blog it's it's great where have you yeah. gone Tom? <laughs> oh, sorry folks i'm just swapping the battery out on my camera <laughs> <laughs> i was hoping i was gonna do it before you got to the end of that oh sorry there. sorry I, I just i thought something had gone wrong on my end i thought it had just gone funny no i should be back now there we go there we go hello mate <laughs> <laughs> um there was also another question here um you kind of answered it already, but um, if you want to just say it briefly again. So, Mike, after owning a Canon, what made you switch to Sony camera? Was it a cost, feature, quality, etc.? So, the main thing for me was was features. It's not... I wouldn't say that I like, I'm like. i a diehard affiliate to any camera brand. I mean, obviously, if there's any camera brands out there watching that would like me to be, perfect, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, definitely. <laughs> but, um, but, no, the reality is that you know, I, I, I did look at, at the Canon cameras available at the time and I was looking at the C cameras, but I felt that for the, the cost of what I was paying, I wasn't getting anywhere near as many features um, in the Canon C range at, at, you know, at the cost that I was willing to, to spend at the time. And Sony and Panasonic were doing much better things for the same price and giving me almost double of what I could get. So that's the only reason I, I switched really. Um, it, it wasn't any, you know, it, it literally was just a lack of features that the Canons weren't weren't offering at the time, really. No, that's fair enough. Um, I think it's, you, uh, and and it doesn't mean that there's any, anything wrong with the camera. It's just when you, uh, yeah. you uh, what's the word? You, out, you almost outgrow it, don't you? Definitely, so, definitely. And I mean, I, still now, even on TV shoots, um, I mean, the majority of the TV broadcast stuff I do, it's become a Sony FS, um, FS7, but they're still ones that use Canon C300. And, you know, they're fine, they're great cameras, but for a one-man band where I need slow motion, I need all these features readily available, you know, uh, like as a one-man band documentarian, I can't. I wasn't getting that with the C300 or C100 as well, so it was just a no-brainer for me to switch, really. Cool, man. Um, so in it, here's an interesting question. First of all, I'm interested to know, have um, you ever done any a behind the scenes video for any other photographer? Has any have you ever 
done any kind of something similar to what you do for me to anyone else because the reason I asked that is um, someone uh, I think again it was Stephen Jenkinson said um, I can't find the question here but he more or less said um, is it oh, I thought it was there but if a photographer was approaching a videographer and they wanted a behind the scenes video what what what's what are important questions that a photographer needs to be asking their videographer or or to ask ask it in another way what things do you want to know if you're working with a new photographer who okay. who wants say behind the scene video what things do you Great need question. to know so um really for me the main thing is what's the purpose behind the video so you know whatever the reason is fine but you know uh, so if someone are you doing it for for yourself are you doing it to show your viewers are you doing it because you're really you know that the shoot that's coming up is going to be really interesting and you want to show the process behind it like we've had shoots where it's been very technical and a behind the scenes re is really warranted at that time more so than ever before because you know you're showing the technicality behind um a shoot then after that really the other sort of questions um i suppose you know you can get down to the really sort of small details but it's really like you know, is the location suitable enough? What style of video are we sort of going for? Are we going for something which we do for you where it's, you know, mainly B-roll cut over nice music or are we going for, as it was in the original days, um, where, you know, you've, you've, you're you going to, on on set, we're going to cut to you talking about a piece of equipment on set. Um, it's, I, I think really the whole sort of relationship between a videographer and any client whether it be a, a photographer for behind the scenes or anything really is you want to just establish what the purpose is what your purpose is on set what are you trying to create for this this person really go on good answer good answer Thank you. <laughs> um andy holmes uh have you watched peter mckinnon's the mountains won't remember me short film some of the gear they use is incredible and the grading is amazing no i can't say i have but i do really enjoy peter mckinnon's work I th like some of the videos that he puts up online are just phenomenal and again they're ones that i watch and i think to myself how does he do that i want to know mm. like and that's good you know that that's nice when you when something like that happens and you get inspired and you think oh that's really really cool I, how do how can i do that cool man yeah, but no thank you for the recommendation andy i'll um i'll note that down uh we've got another question here from uh from steve mike do you prefer shooting tommy's behind the scenes or live streams Oh, tough question. I mean, um, it's totally different beasts, right? Yeah. I, I said it to you, didn't I, after we shot the first live stream. I, like, I, I, I was on a buzz after that. I felt amazing. And I haven't, for, for years, I haven't done anything that sort of live streamed like that. Um, and it was nice because, as you just sort of said, it's a different beast, really. You know, it's completely different. Everything is... Every mistake is readily available for people to see and you can't let an editor gloss over and edit <laughs> out any of your crap camera work because everyone's going to see it. Um, but knowing that for however long you're going live for an hour or so, knowing that that's it and that's done and there's nothing you can do that's gone out and it's it's there. That was amazing. That that was like really good fun. It was like, it felt like a bit of a new, like a fresh lease of life really for video um but i think coming down to it creative like creatively i don't think you can sort of beat what we do like especially i know we're talking a lot about it and it seems unfair because you can't see it but this latest video that we've done and obviously previously the um uh, holly video that we did as well mm. um like having that mixture of behind the scenes video photography and an interview is sort of like all of my favorite things combined and i think that overall it probably it probably is the, the behind the scenes videos but i love the live streams and i'm hoping that we can start doing some more again soon yeah definitely you know you, you're uh, and and they are different beasts really are they Cause they're and they're so different it's such a different approach and uh St uh yeah Stephen jenkins said it live must be nerve-wracking for all involved it's oh. just so much technicality so many wires so many cables and so many little nitty-gritty i mean um uh, uh Stephen butler who's watching um he he will know he's he, he assists and helps out as well and cassie vision mixes is just and dan 
and Dan obviously is, um, uh, helps out as well. It's just, and Graham as well. I keep, sorry. I keep, uh, and, yeah, <laughs> everyone, the whole crew, the whole crew. There's, it, it's just so, so, you, you can't, it's impossible to do it on your own to that production quality anyway. And, yeah. and I just wanted to kind of follow suit and create a production as high as the behind the scenes videos rather than, you know, just doing something like this, which is, which is fine. I wanted to, you know, see if I can obviously step it up as, as I like to do with my work. But, um, the Holly video that you mentioned, um, we had a question about the Holly video, uh, what lighting equipment was used for the interview with Holly? Okay. I can't, I'll be honest. I can't fully remember everything. I know that we had, um, a light that I think I'm using now. We had one of the Pix Pro redheads. Um, with a big softbox on a big 90 centimeter softbox and that was um, our key light for Holly um, obviously as you can see as well in this in the picture there's loads of windows here so there's loads of natural light coming through for the day um, and then we had was that again was that another Pixpro um, redhead that we had at the back for her hair light Yes, it was a. Um, oh, what's the? I, what's I can't. It was it the LED one, the Pixpro LED Mark II or something. I think it was actually the their mark three it's their bicolor led That's i think it. it's a, a thousand watt and it's a bowens fit which means you can put any um any of their modifiers on if you check out my youtube channel and this is actually a still from from the video but there is a behind the scenes video about it and here here i am explaining it all so as you can see here yeah, so um oh <laughs> weird weird up pause on the eyes but perfect pause <laughs> for the image but um yeah so, yeah, so as you can see, you know, in that top right-hand corner, just like where the um, the little eye is for the information, you can see the, the hair light coming through there. Um, and that's creating a really nice hair light uh, on the side of her face there. Um, and there's plenty of natural light coming through these windows, which was great. Um, and then, we, as we sort of said, you know, we had the big big um, softbox um, as a key light on her face. And it was just... It, just worked perfectly on the day we were a bit bit cautious because um it was quite an overcast day and obviously where we were relying on the natural light like you know there was unless we shot into a corner there was no way we were going to get away without showing this light and obviously we wanted to show the entirety of this building so we had to sort of go for it and and thankfully when we filmed that it, the light wasn't dipping in and out too much but that would have been a bit of a problem had it been but it was I, i'm really happy of how that shoot came out and that interview especially actually i think it was um it was great well if, if, if speaking about um this kind of new way for us of of making behind the scenes where we're now doing that this hybrid system um i mean the first kind of taste we got was when we did our james documentary and yeah. when i approached wanting to do this holly shoot i wanted to basically do a condensed version of the james documentary and rather and and ra rather than obviously make it as long as it was, we wanted like a nice short kind of eight to 12 minute portion of that, which is why, um, I, and I just think they do so well. And you you get to hear it from the horse's mouth. You, it's not just a caption next to the image. You actually, we have a photo shoot and then we do this nice interview. And it's just that there's nothing more we can add content wise or context wise to make you appreciate the images or understand where, what, um, about the person we're, we're combining everything we've got our style of behind the scenes nice b-roll the images and then of course we now have the interviews which we're starting to introduce more of now but because we've now introduced interview that means more time a lot more time um but, but before we move on with the interview um, um with with this interview what um audio was we using what was the microphone we were using so we had um, the same microphone that I'm using now. It was a, I'm going to just touch it a second. It was a Rode NTG2. Um, and we had that on a boom pole, which you can see in the image as well. Um, we put a blimp over the top because on that, obviously, well, you can't, it's not obvious, but um, where, with all these windows, there was a lot of them that were open. It was freezing cold in there. Mm. And um, there was a lot of like ambient noise being picked up. Oh, that's a great picture to show. Yeah. Um, so we had that pointed directly down towards Holly. We also, and that was going into a, um, a Tascam DR60 Mark II, uh, which I had, you, again, it's, you can sort of see it in that picture there. It's just next to my camera on a tripod. 
um, and I was sort of adjusting audio levels. Um, obviously, we both sort of checked the audio before before we started, and we were happy. And I was just there to adjust for any gain of you know if she was peaking, etc. And then as a backup, Holly had a microphone, um, a lapel mic. Is that that's one of your ones? Is it? Is that the um, the Rode Smart Love Plus? Yeah, Rode Smart yeah. Love Plus. Yeah, but in the end, in the video, I didn't actually use it at all. So but no. it was just a backup. Exactly. Yeah, and I can't remember if on my camera if I had a. Um, my Rode Video Mic Pro. I don't think I have. I don't think I can see it there. Um, but that would that I think that's because that's currently broken at the moment. But that um, that's something that I'd put on as well. Again, no, we're not expecting to use Holly's um, lapel mic or the mic that would have been on top of my camera. We're always hoping to get the best audio possible from the um, the Rode NTG2 that's pointing down. But all of these things are a backup. Because with audio, you know, you never know. They can all, there's, it, it's one of those things you can kind of forgive bad, bad images or like bad, mm. like the odd bad shot in a video. But uh, for me, like if, if audio goes wrong, I think that's just you notice it straight away. I don't know what it is, but like it just, it just sticks out so much, doesn't it? No, definitely. Um, I, there's uh, there's a famous saying that I can't remember it. Like you can. You can get away with bad video, but you can't get yeah. You can't get away with bad audio. Yeah, I think like I'm I'm probably going to get butchered this quote, but I think George Lucas said something like that. I think he said something like, uh, "Films are seventy percent audio and thirty percent video," which is crazy, as it's like a visual medium. But the reality is, you know, you you pick up on bad audio, and it just it sticks with you. It's horrible. So, so yeah. So essentially, those other two microphones were there um, as backups in case there was any issues with this mic here. Gotcha. Cool. Um, really good question coming from Andy. Uh, he says, nope, wrong one. Add, th add that one, Andy. Come on, mate. <laughs> really good question. So he says, with all the work that you've done, including stuff outside of Tommy's work, what makes you feel the most creatively fulfilled? Oh, oh that's, a, that's a good question, Andy. Um, I think... It's telling someone's, it's, it really is, you know, telling a story, telling someone's story. So, for example, the, the best example I can pick is the James documentary that we did. I, I don't think I've ever felt that creatively fulfilled from anything before. And, you know, whether that's sort of a bit of a selfish thing, I don't know. But, but like, just to be able to, it was like, it sort of almost went beyond the, the film for me, really. Like, you know me and you we got to spend some amazing quality time with james and it, you know sort of like you you gain a friend don't you you know and the, the memories that you all have are all about this video and this thing that you've created um and i think that's something that will stick for me forever that 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 video in particular um and you know like yeah it came out amazing it was great and and we got to like you know show it in a cinema and everything like that it was just it was it was it was perfect and obviously you know unfortunately james isn't with us anymore and having something like this where he's able to tell his story which is a remarkable story it you know just sort of like it lives on forever really and it yeah it was just just brilliant really documentary has always been your first love hasn't it mike definitely definitely yeah and i think that's and i i very much enjoy it documentary as well and and that's why I, I really like what we're doing with these hybrids at the moment because it almost allows us to inject a little bit of a the documentary genre in these behind the scenes videos we're now almost cross you know cross genre ing <laughs> that's yeah right. where, definitely. where we're just trying to cram in as much context as we can and so so you really gain and have that understanding fulfillment and you're right this is one of if not the most personal thing that we've ever done and um if you haven't seen it please go and watch it it's, it's about half an hour long it's called life from a different angle and it's about this guy james dunn if you don't know him he's a photographer um who was based in liverpool and he had um recessive dystroph dystrophic epidemiolysis below so which is a horrible skin condition um and it's a terminal condition and it was it was part of a BBC show, which was how we found out about him. And he was on a BBC show where um, product design engineer Jude Pullen had designed a camera rig enabling James to use his camera 
without the use of his dad. He didn't need his dad anymore to hold the camera up to his face. And when I saw that documentary, I immediately reached out to him and we spent the weekend with him. And um, this is just clips, as you as you can see mm. on screen here from from that. And it was just an awesome, awesome uh, trip. I loved it so much. It, I can still remember, actually. So this is the end um, when he was given that last interview. And this was actually about half 11 at night i think this was quite late yeah and we'd, we'd really over, like well not necessarily overrun but we'd filmed so much during the day hadn't we that like this was the last thing we said we needed before we left really yeah and look this smile that he gives here right there Aww. and he's and the reason he's smiling right there <laughs> the reason he's smiling right there is he was like almost like laughing at us because we were just so overwhelmed with emotion like i remember oh, yeah I was I was getting really choked, and I turned to you, Mike, and I and I said, um, uh, "Do you have any questions, Mike?" And you went, uh, "You were like, I'm sorry, like, like, like I, I I don't like you were just you were so was, emotional." You can say it, it's fine. I was I was crying. I was in, I was in a state, and then like you said, you know, we were like that because it was just for us. This was the first time we really got to see like James James really open up and tell us this story. And we turn back to him, and he's just laughing. He's like, "Shut up! This is my life. Why are you? Why like he had he had nothing, didn't he? he? Was like, oh, whatever. Like, come on, <laughs> this is fine." And me and you're like emotional wrecks in the corner, yeah, trying to film. <laughs> oh yeah, that's great. I forgot that that's the the reason he was smiling at the end. Actually, that's perfect. Yeah, he was such a funny bloke, wasn't he? Just, just absolutely hilarious. He had us in stitches the whole time. Hundred percent, hundred percent. Yeah. I'll just the best shoot best shoot um so going going i, I want to go back to uh, our behind the scenes videos and talk about um on the day and uh, how it kind of works and logistics because um what people might not be aware of is how much you are involved during the shoot as well so yes right we do lots and lots of planning but what i also want to reiterate to people is the reason mike's able to get all the footage and get everything he he needs is because mike is not afraid to say to me tommy can we just can you pull your camera out of your bag again or can you just do that i'm now going to step in front where the model is and film you pretending to take photos so what people um if people don't realize that that is reality so there are moments where mike you will step in and and you will get that and it just means that i get more shots to play with in the edit isn't it definitely yeah so it, it, what, i think with that also though there's like a level of respect so obviously although i'm there to get a behind the scenes video for you the main thing is obviously you know these are your photo shoots with your client and i have to be very mindful and respectful of the fact that yes i'm there to get a video but you have to let the photo shoot happen. Now, of course, like Tommy said, don't get me wrong, that, that doesn't mean that I'm shy to go in there. I will sort of say, but you you know, you sort of, you pick your moments and you wait for the right time, really. Um, but yeah, I mean, you have to think of it as well. Once, you know, once you know that they've got their photos and things are going well and, and it, you know, it's looking okay, you know, you are making a video for somebody at the end of the day. You know, Tommy is, although, you know, we're, we're friends, Tommy is my client at the end of the day. So I, you know, I can't just say to him, you know, once we finish the shoot, oh, yeah, I didn't get that shot because I didn't want to interrupt. You know, we're, we're making a video, so we do have to get these shots. But in the same respect, as, I, as I've just said, obviously, you know, you have to get these shots, but you have to be aware that the photo shoot always comes first. Um, but yeah, I mean, I hope I'm not too disruptive on on set, but <laughs> but no, no, there are like you said, you know, there's. I think you've got plenty of photos where you've taken a fake picture and it's just me holding the camera up, like with I next, have, standing next to the model. Or... I've got so many of those photos. I should put a, a little collection together of all the fake photos that I've taken during yeah, the shoot yeah. when they've just been of you with in this pose with your uh, with your shoulder rig. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> definitely definitely but no no but, um, I, go on, yeah sorry. you know those you know like yeah it was like you were going to sort of say really you know that you have to get these shots because you know you'll need a, I, I know that in the video i'll need a shot of you taking a picture and the, oh and sometimes you can get that naturally without disturbing the shoot but there are some times where you know you're in a tight corner so the only way i'm going to get that is if i step in front of a model 
But again, as I've said before, just make sure that, you know, if this is the first time you work with a video a photographer, you know, and you're coming from the videography standpoint, make sure that the photographer's happy, they've got what they need to, um, and just being respectful, really. And I think another another thing to mention um, on, on, on this bit that we're talking about right now <clears> is, um, which I've just forgotten about, <laughs> it's literally just, just gone by my mind. Oh, no, that was it, that was it, that was it. So... This is something that I re um, that, uh, that's really important that I'm that I, I think uh, a lot of people will, will really really get a um, kick out of knowing. So when I'm ready to move on to the next setup, so this is really important, yeah. and I think Mike knows now what I'm about to say. Yeah. When I'm ready to move on to the next setup, I always turn to Mike and say, I "I'm ready to move on." do you need to get anything else? And this is really important. So if you're a photographer and you're working with a videographer, always say this to your videographer. When yeah. you're ready to move on, tell them you're ready to move on and then find out if your videographer has enough behind the scenes shots, variety of clips, and Michael will talk briefly more about this in a sec, if they have enough before they're ready to move on. So do you want to just elaborate that's a, that's on that? a great point. Yeah, actually, I forgot to say that because yeah, I mean, especially when the photographer does that for you as well, um, it, it, it's, it's a bit more relaxing. You know you know that they're also thinking about the video as well. Um, whereas if I was constantly the one button in every time, you know, you sort of start to think, oh, I'm taking over this and stuff. But no, I think that's perfect what you said. And, and as you said, you know, you sort of say, have you got everything? So there's definitely no definitive checklist for no. what we get we you know we do like to make it we do always say you know let the creativity flow make sure you know you're not getting something just for the sake of getting something but of course with each setup we need to make sure that some shots are covered um so we always like to try and get at least a wide of a setup so that you can see you know you, you can see exactly where the lights are placed because as much as it is about getting beautiful b-roll you know as we mentioned earlier about behind the scenes, you want to know the information. So as a photographer watching, you know, you'll want to see where's that light placed, where's Tommy placed in the room, where's the model placed, how does it all sort of work? So it's mainly just about capturing enough content that you feel like you're being as creative as you want to be, but also that you're covering exactly what the story needs to tell. And for the behind the scenes, the story is how do you film, how do you do a photo shoot? what goes into a photo shoot, you know? So just as long as you make sure you're capturing that. And and sometimes, um, you know, we might be working with a company, so you might need a close up of of their logo or of their product. You know, just, it's just about making sure that you know you've got everything that you, you've, uh, you need. And that again comes down to, as we mentioned before, about the planning. So plan, 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 and you, you will, you know, these things will come naturally on set and you won't be as panicked or as worried about them. Cool. Good answer. And I, and I do think it's a really good point that pe people realize that because the last thing, as Stephen Jenkinson said, videographers will always um, want as much footage as possible as it cannot be done again when you get home to your editing suite. So the last thing that I would want is to get home and I know I've got a really great shot from a particular setup. So I'm looking for clips from that particular setup. And if for if Mike, for example, only gave me one or two clips to play with it's is obviously that that would be really disheartening but obviously mike doesn't do that because i i check with him do we have enough and because it and there are times where he said yep yeah, i've got loads or there are times where he said i i would i would be comfortable if i got a couple more shots because because he'll he'll have a mental checklist of how many clips he's got in that particular setup yeah um because the last thing i want um i'd much rather mike do that i'd much rather mike say well no i need a few more shots i'd ra much rather he do that than he keep quiet and then we just move on and then i get home and i've not got enough clips um from that particular setup definitely because you know as i've sort of said a moment ago you know at the end of the day you know the as a videographer this is your client and although that it seems weird because you're your client is someone else who's creative and they've got their own creative agenda for the day. You you know, if I turned around at the end of the shoot and said something, I haven't got enough. Yeah. I, 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 thankfully, that's never happened. But I mean, you know, then that's it. You, you know, technically you've ruined, you've ruined your side of the shoot. You know, you have, you have a bargain to keep up. It's like, it's like if it were any other video shoot, really, you know, you, you know what you need to make the video work. And that's a really, really good point where you said that you, you, you want, you want the, photographer to be the creative but at the same token i want 
you to have creative freedom as well. So I, I, I never restrict you. If you see something that you want to get, you will just do it. And you know that because of, again, our relationship. And it all, you know, it comes back to relationship. And I've said this in previous videos is that um, your style is my brand. And it's so important if you're watching as a photographer, if you can work with the same group of people, it's it's the best feeling ever. You are only as good as your team. And that's why I like to, as I said earlier, I like to, I, I would much rather have Mike give Mike an assistant than give me an assistant first. Mike is my priority. Mike is the best asset to my business because the the videos that that we make are my favorite assets and things that I sh I can show as a, as a business person because I'm as you all know you know how much I love these behind the scenes videos so if Mike's happy I'm happy if I can keep him as happy as possible give him as much time as we as we need so if I you know as, as we all know if if we're on a time limit it might restrict you so of course. that's that's why that this is the video is the whole reason we have longer shoots is because it gives mike time to get what he needs and i can deliver a really cool behind the scenes video for you guys um we'll do a few more questions because we have run way over the hour so we've got a few um couple more questions coming if you have any more questions then do drop them in now as we'll we'll wrap up because i appreciate we've been online for a while now but um uh daniel said question for you both would you keep making these videos if it was only a few people watching them, um, 100%. Definitely. 100%. Yeah. This is, I mean, I, I can't speak for Mike, but this is the whole reason I started my YouTube channel. I started this because I wanted to make an archive and sh and to look back on and, and show and see what we did. And as you know, I've got a b background in video anyway. I have an interest in it anyway. And I just wanted to be able to, you know, work with a mate, with Mike yeah. and create these create a behind the scenes, just so we can look back, just so I can look back. And, and it's so beautiful that I can see, and I've now got my YouTube channel and I can see myself growing as a professional and physically see myself growing as yeah. well. And I, it's just so amazing that I can look back on these videos. It, one thing to look at the stills, but it's another to see the behind the scenes video, which includes the stills. So it's kind of, it's, it's got more context to it. So, mm. 100 million percent i would still be making these videos because that is what makes me the most creatively fulfilled is making these videos so i would 100 percent be doing that i mean you answered the perfect <laughs> answer there but exactly that you know for the same thing that as you sort of said it's, it's a mate that we've had nights where we've we haven't done it one for a little while but we have had nights before where we've sat back and watched all of our old videos haven't we like we even went back to like gcse and a levels like before we knew each other and like, just when you do that, there's something amazing, isn't there, about seeing your progression and like, if you can look back and laugh at something you experimented and tried with and you're like, oh God, that did not work. Or, you know, or you can even look back and see something. Oh, he's gone again. <laughs> he's dead again. Keep going, keep going, keep <laughs> no going. Um, yeah, you know, or you can sort of, you look back and you think, oh my God, I can't believe we created that on a shoestring budget or we did that. And it looks like an amazing location, but really it's like my nan's bathroom or something, you know. Like, <laughs> I've done that with a short film. We shot it all in one of my bathrooms upstairs because we were doing like a 127 um, hours um, <laughs> thing. It was for like a like an Empire Film Awards we, we did it for. And like, you know, you just look back and you think, I can't believe we created that all those years ago. Um, so yeah, 100% definitely would keep doing them. A and for the same thing of what you said about being creatively fulfilled, because although I do a lot of uh, sort of like TV and, uh, and like corporate work, you know, yes, sometimes you get the creative freedom, but a lot, a lot of the times there's so many overheads and there's so many other people above your station that have got a different agenda for that, how this thing needs to work for a network. You know, you've got um, your series producers, executive producers, all of this, you know, you might have an idea, but th the reality of it is that's not fitting into their vision. Whereas this it's two mates who, who are just sort of, not winging it, definitely not winging it. But, you know, we've got that level where we're like, can I try this? Of course you can. Yeah, that's fine. And, you know, this is kind of going off the question now, but don't be afraid to try things out on, on these shoots because I've definitely tried shots before that I thought, oh, that would be amazing. I've spent like five minutes setting it up, got Cassie helping me. We've, we've done it. And I've watched it back and gone, do you know what? That is awful. That really, <laughs> that really does not work. I thought that was going to be great. But 
it's fine. They're the times. I mean, you've you've said this extensively before, extensively before. But like, this is the time to do that, to have that experiment and try things out. And yeah, the, I wouldn't give up these shoots for the world. They're amazing. Cool, man. I'm I'm glad you're as enthused uh, about them as me. Um, definitely, definitely. Stephen Jenkinson, if you didn't have brands helping towards the budget, would the production value be the same? That's a really good question. Um, to an extent, they will be because in the beginning and sometimes now, even recently, um, I will put my own money into making these work. So, for example, the last shoot we did, we collaborated with Leica. Leica only loaned me a camera. They did not pay anything towards the video. So we're when when a brand doesn't pay me, you know, we don't have to be obligated to include x number of seconds worth of logos for example you know when it's when we're just borrowing the camera we can do what we want but when it's when i it so for the last shoot i paid i paid um uh, mike's time i paid for the studio's time so in it i i i want to keep them the same because i enjoy doing them it's what makes me creative the field it's not a hobby obviously because I'm, I'm going to hopefully use it as a long-term thing so i like to think of it as more of a long-term thing i'm hoping that if I put in this much effort that a brand will see it and maybe I'll get paid the next time. But certainly not every single shoot is paid for, but I still try and keep it the same production quality. Not just because I'm trying to fulfill other people's needs on YouTube. I want to fulfill my needs. You know, just because no one's paying me doesn't mean I'm going to do this shoot in a, in a, in my studio, which is tiny, that I know the limitations, you know, if I've got this concept, I want to do it, I will find a way, if you're passionate about something, you will find a way to fund it, and I, I, if, if, if the money isn't there, then I'll find a way to pay for it, because I want to do it, simple as that, investment, absolutely, yeah, I, was, I didn't want to interrupt, but I was going to say, yeah, it's definitely an investment, you know, but you know, if you take out the aspect of it, as you said, it's creatively fulfilling for yourself and all and and all that side of things. The reality of it is, you are, you are sort of investing yourself, and you're showing people. It's like a like a, an insight into how your shoot works, isn't it? You know, and that also goes well for for other playing clients, such as models and things like that. They might look at that and think, oh, you know, the way he is on a shoot is is great. It, it's really natural. How whatever they might think, and they might want to work with you that way, or you know, or um, like uh, big brands might want to do it. You know, it, there's so many different avenues that it opens up. 100%. I mean, we're, we're kind of, uh, we could easily talk another half an hour about oh. the whole, the the using the behind the scenes as a marketing tool. Maybe we can uh, save that, it for, yeah. for, for another time. But but yeah, you, you're 100% right. I, yes, I've paid, I've paid out all, uh, money out of my own pocket. You know, personal projects have to come from that kind of place of love first, you know. And I've said this on in previous podcasts that if a brand won't pay for my concept, I'm gonna do it anyway, with or without them. I I don't I don't care that that Leica was involved in my last video in my last video. It was it was lovely that they that they were, but if they weren't involved, I would have still done that anyway. I would have yeah. used my Canon 5D Mark III as I have done. But the fact that they that um that they said yes to being involved means that hopefully I can give them the video and they will share the video and then it just means that it will be seen by more people but as 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 we said to Dan's question I'm doing it for myself mm. which not to sound um selfish in in that respect I'm doing it because I love it because I want to do it but if I can use it and encourage other brands to get involved l later down the road because as I've as I've done in the past and as we've done in the past, we still produce the same quality with or without a brand. And I maybe I like to think that that's why people invest in our, in our work, because the love is clearly there. We clearly love what we do. Uh, last question. Tommy does excellent online coaching and portfolio reviews. Thank you, man. Thank you. Um, Mike, do you offer the same for people? Um. I mean, I haven't previously, but I would be very happy to. Um, I, yeah, it was last year when I, we were at the photography show. Oh, feels like feels like forever <laughs> ago now. Oh. Um, I did my first talk, and um, it was to students. And 
a lot of them took my sort of like information to contact me. And afterwards I had about four or five of them um, do like online Skype interviews. Um, and they were asking me loads of questions, you know, things to help them with their transition into, into video with their uni work, things like that. And that was great. And that was really good. And I'm still in contact with quite a few of them now. Um, so yeah, I mean, I'd be more than happy to offer that to anybody. You know, if there's anyone watching that wants a bit more advice or wants to know anything a bit more, um, I don't know if I've given, oh yeah, there you go. There's, there's my handle there for Instagram, you know, um, yeah, go on, uh, give me a message. I'd be more than happy to speak to people or do as, as sort of Tommy does do, you know, do a one-on-one -on -one if someone thinks that'd be, um, helpful for them. So yeah, thank you for a bit of a <laughs> bit of promotion for myself there. Thank you, mate. <laughs> Cheers, Steve. <laughs> Guys, if you... 10% it... cut for Steve if uh, <laughs> yeah. there's any work that comes through. <laughs> um, well, Mike, I, I, thank you so much for agreeing to come on and have this little chat. Um, it's been really fun. Um, oh, yeah, definitely. It's been amazing. I was very, very nervous beforehand. I'm not... Was you really? I'm not, yeah, I was. I'm just I'm just not very used to being in front of the camera. So, But it was it was great. And I, I appreciate, obviously, all the questions everyone's been asking. And, you know, it's, it's been really good fun. Just just sort of like reminiscing on, on memories we've had about filming, you know, and getting to talk about it and share our story for people who hopefully are interested and actually wanted to listen. So it's, it's quite nice, actually. Because... With my family, I don't think they're always as interested. You know, you, 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 they 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 love it, but you, when you start going to the geek detail a bit too much, they're a bit like, oh, yeah. Mm. Okay, okay. <laughs> but actually having like a whole group of people who love photography and film and getting to talk about it has been great. So I've really appreciated that. I mean, th th this is why I, I um, why I love the community and the people that follow me, and I'm so thankful for everyone that 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 follows me. And this is. You know, it's great that we can do this because everyone who's watching has that similar interest. So it's it's great that we can do these and we can we can surround ourselves with other like minded people and you know this community of talking utter geeky nonsense that yeah, no one else yeah, understands, yeah, but we but we understand it and we're passionate about it. So, Mike, thanks again. Thanks ever so much for. Um, for coming along and doing this no and uh well, mate, that's fine it's been a pleasure and i i have noticed obviously there's been a few comments every now and then that we didn't answer please if you want any questions if you want me to answer anything that i didn't didn't please just message me and i'll be more than happy to to get that over to you awesome well thank you so much mate it's been brilliant all right um thanks everyone for watching um if you liked it then please make sure you hit the like or share button or subscribe if you are watching this on youtube and please go and follow mr michael mowbray responsible for 99 percent of my, my my youtube is basically your show wheel mike <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah essentially <laughs> essentially yeah thanks ever so much for watching guys and we'll see you all next time